Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios. Today we'll be talking about a very important global change. We always knew uh, that the US, United States of America had a very strong influence over the Arab countries, especially when we talk about the G6 countries, primarily uh, due to the natural resources which they have, whether in the form of oil or gas or otherwise. And then certainly we witnessed that during the last 25, 30 years, a United Arab Emirates in fact developed into a first world kind of a nation where they're never only dependent on the oil or energy resources, rather tourism, business development, production, manufacturing, you name it, and they did that. Even Formula One was held, then you can see tennis tournaments being played there, major golf tournaments are being played there. So whether you talk about sports or otherwise, they had the best airlines, not only one, rather three, four among the top ten, and we saw that uh, the UAE became the hub later on. Qatar became the hub. And uh, now uh, we are also uh, getting to understand that Turkey again is doing uh, amazingly well in this particular field. Whenever the tourist lands, that's the time when they get to know about that particular country. And that's the major influence of attracting tourism. Now, interestingly, over a period of time, what we have witnessed is that United States of America, maybe they have lost their interest uh, especially post 2011 Arab Spring. Uh, whatever their designs were, they have achieved those. Uh, perhaps a lot more is happening out there as well. Uh, certain countries still have the royal system. Some of these countries do claim they have democracy, like Kuwait for that matter. But in general, we understand what's going on out there. But the Chinese influence, whether you talk about Latin America, you talk about Africa, you talk about Middle East, in particular Middle East now since that is the topic, their influence is growing, their investments are multiplying with each passing year. So obviously if there is some investment, there are certain projects. So that is the name of the game. That's what we call diplomatic uh, effort in order to enhance your economy or economic diplomacy is the new word now that has been introduced. So we'll be talking about that what could be the reasons now and what sort of a future uh, UAE or countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, per per perhaps they have there. They were the major partners of the United States of America even when it came to the purchase of uh, military hardware. Look at the kind of strength the Saudis have or perhaps the UAE or uh, countries like Qatar. Qatar had a lot of tilt towards Russians also, but still uh, there was a lot of influence of the Middle Eastern countries and in particular again uh, about um, America when we say that uh, the first visit of Mr. Donald Trump, in fact, was to Saudi Arabia when he took charge. And then a lot happened, they paved way uh, for the acceptance of Israel in that region. Now, that is, is something that has been going on for quite some time. So basically that uh, anti-Israel sentiment has diluted over a period of time in those countries. It does prevail in countries like Pakistan for that matter, Turkey or Malaysia or some other Muslim countries like Iran. But in general, uh, yes, we do see that the blocks are in uh, formation. So to talk about that, let me quickly introduce you to our panelists. We have with us in our studio. On my right is none other than um, Professor uh, Dr. Zafar Nawaz Jaspal Saab, expert on foreign affairs and international relations. So pleasure to have you. Thank Always you. a pleasure to have you on the show, sir. And on Skype uh, from um, Germany, we have with us Harley Schlanger. He's a political analyst and uh, representing the Schleder Institute. Pleasure to have you, Mr. Harley, in the program. Thank you very much for your time. And we'll also be talking to Dr. Mohammed Al-Hakimi, author and a journalist. He's going to join us on the telephone line from UK, London. Uh, now, let me put the first question to you, Dr. Saab. Dr. Saab, if I say uh, that uh, the influence that the Americans were enjoying over the last maybe four or five decades, especially post-1970s and that uh, oil embargo uh, that was there. Right after that, the Americans did understand that controlling the resources, controlling their political influence, uh, having some sort of a check and balance, uh, being the biggest exporter of arms and so on and so forth. So this was the bloc which was very pro-America. But sir, even during the last couple of months or years, let me put it this way, <coughs> what we have noticed is that um, the Chinese are taking over in terms of investments, in terms of their influence, in terms of businesses. And that uh, concept of China being present everywhere, 
the Chinatown uh, philosophy, that's uh, no more an uncommon phenomenon in the Middle East. Perhaps it is there and it's a reality now. Do you think that influence is going to replace the American influence in the coming decades or so, sir? I, I think that uh, we have to first frame what are the both sides' interest in the Middle East. If you focus on the United States, it still thinks that uh, Middle East uh, trade and uh, you can say energy is very important for them, free flow of that both. Second, weapons of mass destruction must not be proliferating in the region. Third, in this context, that to counter and prevent the terrorist organization. And the fourth is, similarly, when we see that the great power or rivals presence they should, must be checked. Now, we have seen that uh, in the last two decades, Middle East, or you can say this part, the region which you are identifying, MENA, they have seen domestic, or the members of the, this region, states have seen domestic as well as external upheavals. And uh, that has now created this region in a form that we have partially failed states there, like say uh, we have a Lebanon, we have a, uh, you can say, instable states there. And at the same time, when the center command or center command was constituted in the 80s, at that time it was seen very important. But we have seen that the Americans, after as you pointed out in the beginning, 2011 and 12 pivot Asia, that they started moving towards the other part or Asia Pacific. Maybe the region, reason was that they started looking that this region is not more lucrative economically for them and strategically a burden. Within the American, if you see uh, people, they look the Middle East as a fatigue for them, especially after the Iraq war, after the Libya's military adventurism of the uh, NATO or all these kind of these things. And in the, uh, when they move towards, it also exposed their limitations there. Mm -hmm. And if you see currently, though next month I, uh, President Biden is, vis is going to visit there, we have seen that within the region there is now a lot of developments are taking place. Such as? Uh, for instance, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia's relationship improving. Turkey is now pro approached the UAE and Israel. Abraham Accord is there. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have seen that uh, uh, there is a rapprochement between the Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we are looking that probability of Syria and these uh, Yemen kind of a things. Uh, there is a hope for Iran and uh, you can say Saudi Arabia's rapprochement, some kind of a sort of a thing. And in such a situation, now a new actor has emerged. In fact, if you see that Americans, especially Trump administrations, this protectionist economy, economic policies, America first uh, look within, which was giving way to the certain uh, mercantilist school of thought with there. It led to the Chinese space because since 2013, China had a already there. If you see, uh, they, if you, uh, they have an outside military base in Djibouti. And then what the American coins system, though Chinese don't accept it, string of pearls, pearls. that is also mm. in that part. Americans have tried to shift the or give the responsibility of the Middle East to other actors like local Levitans, which we call in the strategic studies. Uh, India, for example, Trump administration 2017 national security strategy categorically stated India had a, has a role to had a role to play in. South Asia, Indian Ocean, and beyond. That was a reference to the Middle East. The blue waters. Yeah, blue. So in that context, they were looking that India is there with the necklace of uh, what you call it, uh, diamonds able to check. Now here comes your second part that when we look about the China. If we see that since 2013, Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese, uh, in their two papers I came across, 2015 foreign policy paper and then there was a 2016, in which they had very clearly identified Middle East as an energy for them, trade and investment for the Chinese, and uh, at the same time, in a simplest manner, we say the Chinese have a political-economic interest there. 
Chinese are trying to have a lesser footprints in the security chessboard of the Middle East and that's why they are there. Chinese are everywhere in the Middle East, you rightly pointed out. Our CPAC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, it is going to link from Gawadar to the West Asia and then to the Central Asia. This is a new <coughs> kind of a connectivity, era of a connectivity where the Chinese seem they are having it. But still, there is a third power, Russia. If you see the Gulf states or the Middle States, uh, they did not, uh, you can say, denounce the Russians' invasion in Ukraine. Ukraine. Most of <coughs> them were put in grey list also in yeah. fact for that. <coughs> and they, they, they were there. And uh, uh, in that context, we find that the Americans, uh, with the, in the last one decade, given up or they calculated that they are too much there, let the others participate there. Now, in this context, I can say 400 billion U.S. dollars, 25 years strategic partnership Iran. between Iran and mm -hmm. China. It was, Iranians were earlier not accepting. The process started on this partnership in 2016. But when the Trump cornered the Iranians completely, then they, they have, it became open. Similarly, if you see that the Saudi Arabia and China, then you find the UAE and the China. So, in this kind of a thing, the Middle Eastern sheikhdoms, they are more interested now to multiply their economic uh, pursuits because uh, oil, for how long oil will be there? Exactly, this is the approach so of UAE and is even Saudi Arabia. Arabia and that, that, yeah, that's why this. they are looking at China's connectivity and then from going to the Europe. So, in this context, my understanding is that in the Middle East, all the three great powers, China, Russia, and the United States, of course, uh, they are there, they are assertive, <clears throat> but there seems some kind of a consensus, unwritten consensus. And that's why you cannot find consensus is that the region energy must flow. Uh, there, the, it must remain open for trade. Otherwise, Americans have a still influence in the US, or uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia and UAE, mm -hmm. and they can manage many things. Uh, then the second is counter-terrorism in that part. Mm -hmm. That is the, in the interest of all the three great powers. Uh, then the uh, weapons of mass destruction is not, a proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is not in the interest. If you see in the JCPOA, the um, uh, Russians, Chinese, they, they are working over it. Uh, they, so in that context, my understanding is that on the economic chessboard, they are looking and the Ch Americans are more looking towards the Southeast Asia and with the strategic. At the strategic chessboard, though they are rivals in the other parts, but they, they are not looking Middle East as a big theater because they know it's, it's a fragile region. So they can, they can do whatever they, they want and wherever they want. Absolutely. This region as itself, if one state goes there, the other... Vulnerability, the vulnerability is there, will remain yeah, there. They, they, it will remain there. It makes love. So why, why they can go there for their own? So this is the, my understanding. All right, sir. So let me also bring in um, <clears throat> Mr. Harley in the conversation and let me see what the European perspective is. Mr. Harley, tell us about your <clears throat> approach towards uh, the Middle East when we say that it seems as if China is taking over as far as their own uh, strategic interest is concerned or perhaps their own uh, vision which is very long term uh, is also important whereas the United States of America since they have opened up so many chapters all around the globe whether you talk about Ukraine issue you talk about the Far Eastern Taiwan issue with the Chinese or their influence in the Middle East perhaps then you talk about Afghanistan slowly and surely it seems that their strategic objectives, whatever they had uh, in the previous century or, or during the end or last two decades of the previous century, they are changing. And now since uh, we have witnessed during the first two decades of this century, things have changed. Uh, whatever they wanted in the Middle East, they have done that. They have the regimes which really say yes to them. Let me start off <clears throat> from extreme uh, west of the west, northwest of the African areas starting from Morocco, Algeria, you talk about the regime change or the killing of Muammar Gaddafi, regime change in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak. You talk about again Morsi coming in, then Morsi being replaced and later on killed I would say and then General Sisi came into power. Uh, but I remember I was in uh, Switzerland uh, attending the Human Rights Convention when this Arab Spring started and uh, if I'm not wrong it was July 2011 
and the Bahraini government they were trying their level best to tell the world that you know this could be a sectarian issue there is nothing wrong nothing is going to happen obviously they have the support of the Saudis who had sent uh, tanks as well as uh, APCs in Bahrain to look after the affairs there so what I'm saying is that's a, a Middle Eastern country still being pretty fragile economically I was surprised to know that the total GDP of Saudi Arabia is a little over 600 billion uh, hardly 250 billion more than that of Pakistan mostly oil based so what I'm saying is that um, certain economies if they are dependent on oil uh, to that extent uh, can be squeezed any time Rem imagine Saudi Arabia asking for a loan to IMF a few years back so your take well I think we have to face a reality that many in America do not want to face which is that we've reached the end of the unipolar empire. The idea that the United States, along with the British, and perhaps the NATO countries, can dictate terms economically and militarily to the rest of the world is coming to an end. And there are several reasons for that. One, which you've already identified, the rise of China, where China is offering an alternative economic model based on building infrastructure, energy, economic development, not on speculative finance. And many countries in the global south are orienting toward the Chinese and the Russians right now <clears throat> and away from the American model. Secondly, the uh, um, so-called moral superiority, which the United States takes for itself, the idea that we're a better country, we're the human rights country, we're the democratic country, that's being exposed as hypocrisy. If you look at the effect of sanctions against countries like Syria, against Yemen, against Libya, against Russia, uh, sanctions are a war crime, in my opinion. Secondly, the preaching of democracy, when the United States is arming a regime in Ukraine, which arrested its opposition leaders, shut down its opposition newspapers, uh, outlawed opposition parties, that's not democracy. When they use sanctions to try and degrade a nation like Russia, when they refuse to recognize the legitimate security demands of, of Putin, then this is where you see the collapse of an empire, the collapse of the moral identity of the United States. And I think much of the world is recognizing that now and turning away. That's why when the U.S. and the British are lecturing the Indians, the Argentines, the Brazilians, the South Africans, join us for sanctions against Russia, they're being told no. The Indian foreign minister gave a real rebuke to the British when he said, we're not sitting on the fence, we're standing our ground. We don't want to be in one block or another. So what we're seeing is the emergence of, of a sort of a new non-aligned movement that doesn't want to have to take sides but actually is interested in economic development, not war, not austerity, not international monetary fund diktats. And that's why I think the reality is that the unipolar empire is nearing its end. Now, there was another very interesting statement uh, given by the Americans, and they said um, to the Saudis that uh, uh, increase the oil production. And at the same time, uh, not only in Saudi Arabia, but also in UAE. And you know how much influence Saudis have over the United Arab Emirates. And they also mentioned that stop protecting the assets of the Russian billionaires. So there are certain pacts between the Russians and the Turkish in this regard. Uh, and, and a lot is happening. Just look at this huge deal of shells. I mean, this man who is a Russian who owned this particular, I would say, uh, group. Uh, and he could not even get a single penny because... 3 billion will go uh, as charity. Now what I'm saying is that uh, I, I, I fail to understand a couple of other points. So please t tell me uh, and also uh, tell our viewers about it. Whether you talk about the assets of uh, Saddam Hussein who was killed, his sons were killed and it was believed that the man in fact owned over 72 90 billion dollars worth of assets in the forms of uh, gold, uh, jewelry, uh, paintings, real estate, cash and so on and so forth. You talk about Hosni Mubarak, his wife and his son and himself are worth, uh, were worth I would say over 150 billion dollars. More than 200 billion dollars of the Iranians are still stuck and frozen in the western banks. What I'm saying is same the case is happening with the Russians. Tomorrow there, there are going to be more charges 
uh, on, on certain other individuals uh, who hail from the countries which are considered to be adversaries of the Americans. Now my point is that this is the influence then, sir. Chinese can't do that. Russians can't do that. Only American can do that. So don't you think it is a little uh, too early to say that the American influence isn't there anymore? So we want to get rid of FIT, FATF. We need to have the support of the Americans. You want to get some money from IMF, you need to have the support of the uh, Americans. I mean, this means that the world which we think is no more uh, a unipolar world, it's a bipolar or a multipolar. In fact, it's a little too early to say that, isn't it? Are you asking me that? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, I, I think, again, if you look at the U.S. policy, you mentioned Iraq, you look at Libya, uh, supposedly the U.S. was going to go in to help free those countries. And it was, again, a complete fraud. The U.S. interest is defending and protecting the corporations that are in the grain cartel, the energy cartel, the military cartel, and the finance cartel. They're willing to impose austerity on every other nation while running the printing presses of the United States to degrade the dollar, but forcing everyone to stay with the dollar. Now we're seeing the Saudis talking with the Chinese about accepting the yuan for payments for oil. We're seeing India and Russia talking about a ruble, rupee uh, exchange rate. Yes. We're, we're looking at all the countries that are interested in their own sovereign economic development that don't want to surrender that right to develop to a gang of global banks. And the United States, unfortunately, is siding with the global banks, the speculators, against the producers of nations, saying that you can't spend money on infrastructure, you can't spend money on hospitals, on education, until you pay the debt. And the Chinese have shown flexibility. The Chinese are now coming around the world with various development banks, the BRICS Bank, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Bank, and they're saying, we'll give you good terms on credit to build something that's productive. Whereas the United States is saying, we'll loan you more money to make you deeper in debt to pay your existing debt. Well, it's a no brainer. Who are you going to choose? And I think that's where the United States is losing the war. And instead, they're trying to blame it on Putin. They're trying to blame it on Xi Jinping. Uh, and they're trying to use a new muscular NATO in Asia to enforce a containment of China. I think ultimately it won't work. The danger is we could end up in a, a world war or even a nuclear war, unless the war hawk's hands are taken off the nuclear button in the United States. And at this point, Biden is a captive of these banking interests and these military interests. All right. Now, uh, we've also been joined in by Dr. Mohammed Al-Hakimi, author, senior journalist. Uh, Dr. Al-Hakimi is joining us from uh, London, UK. Welcome to the program, uh, Dr. Sab. Thank you very much uh, for your time as well. Thank you, Al Hashimi, not Al Hakimi, Al Hashimi. Okay, Al, Al Hashimi. All right, sir. Thank you very much uh, for correcting me. Now, uh, my, my straightforward question, you know, sir. First of all, uh, after the discovery of its oil reserves, especially the shale oil uh, that the Americans are extracting from the oil, and uh, you know, they, they've got huge uh, amounts of oil in Alaska and even in Canada. Now, their dependence on the Middle Eastern countries as far as energy resources are concerned. Uh, that's being reduced, number one. Secondly, sir, when you, when you say cold shoulder to the West and enhanced engagement with the China and Russia, Arab world is in fact diversifying its option, like uh, Mr. Uh, Harley just mentioned that Yuan and uh, Real, that's how they're going to uh, do trade as far as oil is concerned. Russia is offering the ruble for that matter with, with other currencies, rupee, uh, as far as India is concerned. India is the second, third largest importer of Russian oil. So what I'm saying is that the global change is very much there. Uh, I think you shouldn't uh, exaggerate uh, the possibilities that uh, Arab uh, governments in the Middle East have when dealing with the United States. I mean, for example, the idea that uh, Gulf countries may exchange oil and other commodities with the yuan currency, not the U.S. dollar. I don't think it's a, a realistic uh, prospect. 
I think it was probably mentioned because of some tension that happened between the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and President Biden. And the policy was to probably pressurize a bit Washington and Mr. Biden to recognize Crown Prince and deal with him, which is, I think it will be happening at the end of this month in the trip of Mr. Biden to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. The relations between uh, Gulf countries and the United States are uh, very strong. They have uh, a security aspect that is uh, historical. Uh, like the, the countries do rely on good relation with the U.S. And uh, so we shouldn't expect like major changes in the strategy of Arab governments, especially in the Gulf, vis-a-vis the United States. Their relationship with China is uh, not a competitive one. Even China itself, I don't think China wants to replace the Americans in the Gulf. I don't think China wants to compete with the Americans why, in the Gulf. Why is that Maybe, so? Yeah, because uh, think about what do China exactly need from the Gulf. They only need to buy like uh, secure resources of oil and gas. They can buy the oil from Saudi Arabia, Oman, uh, UAE. They can buy gas from Qatar. And that's it. They don't want to get involved in the messy political difficulties in the Middle East between Israel and the Arab uh, countries and stuff. So maybe China have got different view with, vis-a-vis, for example, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan. These are neighboring countries. These are uh, like uh, the interests there are much bigger than say Saudi Arabia or Qatar or Oman or Kuwait to, 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 to China. I don't think if you look at uh, the major papers on this stuff that you will find that China, is, for example, wants to drive the U.S. out of, uh, of the Gulf. The main interest is economical. The main interest is uh, the growing uh, the Chinese economy wants more oil, wants more gas. They will find it uh, from these countries. And there are some forums of Arab-Chinese dialogue, Arab-Chinese relations, but it is not. China doesn't look at the Arab world as something really vital to its interests or to its security. And uh, so I think this is how China looks at the region. And the region itself, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Gulf countries, their main ally is the United States. That's whom they want to keep the strongest relation with, and they can do without those relations, strong relations with Washington specifically. All right. Now, coming to you, Dr. Saab, one thing, <clears throat> recognition of Israel. Uh, UAE has opened up their uh, embassy. A very young, dynamic, smart uh, ambassador has been assigned to look after the uh, various uh, tasks that uh, have been given to him. Now, sir, uh, Saudi influence letting the Israeli planes, you know, use their airspace. And so much more is happening there as well. There were reports that the, there was a meeting held also between the Crown Prince and the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Israel. Now the question is, uh, at the same time, we also get to hear that the kind of influence which the Americans are looking forward to from the Middle Eastern countries against Russia, especially in the wake of this uh, Ukrainian war, that uh, sort of a support hasn't been mustered from the uh, Middle Eastern countries so far, sir. So, I mean, on one side, we see things happening very positively according to the will and the wishes of the Americans or their government. On the other side, sir, there seems to be a confusion. So, do you think they are also, these, the Middle Eastern uh, leaders, also trying to strike a balance now? I think that, uh, let me start what my uh, friend said with this reference to that the China is not looking any conflictual area and it tried to avoid the conflicts in the Middle East. And uh, that's why I said also in my previous uh, discussion that uh, China on the uh, military or a security or a strategic chessboard is not visible in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. But we have to not forget about the systemic forces when the great powers in one region Without any desire, the conflict, the conflict emerges. The Americans are checking the Chinese in the South China Sea, Taiwan. Americans initiated 
And uh, uh, from the very beginning, since 2007, very clearly Russians were telling them that our ex states, except these three, Eastern Asia, Latvia, you cannot uh, touch these states, but they went for. Now, what's your question is that uh, if so far the Americans, they try to facilitate conflict resolution between Israel and its Arab challengers, but they fail to settle the real cause, Palestinians. Uh, maybe with this settlement they try to do. Second is that... Do, uh, do you see any, any development in that regard uh, during the visit of uh, Mr. Biden to Jeddah? There will be, of course, it will be a, uh, you can say Biden is going to shake hand with the MBS and uh, there is a loss of this journalist killing and everything has been settled. So the problem of the, that Middle Eastern states also seems that they are grown up. Mm -hmm. They are no more, you can say, simply looking for their security towards the... No more uh, subservient to the yeah, Americans. That was very clear. And uh, uh, of course, UAE is a different case. Uh, UAE is a very small, tiny state, and within that, if uh, it's airlines or one check on it, FATF further mature it, they have a problem. But uh, at the same time, despite this, that the Americans had a lot of influence on them, but this influence is not transforming, changing. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Americans also realize that they, for the stability of their economy, they need to engage the others. But now your final question, which was with reference to Russia, I think that the Americans were not expecting this. The way the GCC states Reacted. one can expect mm -hmm. from the Iran, but on the Ukraine, they did not support. And uh, <clears throat> then the, the Russian foreign minister visited the, the states, and their response was very positive. Uh, even they were not ready to assist the, follow the American calls for pumping more oil in the market. So by this way, I think that the influence of the Americans uh, it's still there, it's very decisive there, but at the same time there is no space for the other states. But now finally, if somebody thinks that the Americans are not, uh, you can say, agitated, or Chinese are not, uh, you can say, careful about it, they have to take into account that the way the Americans have been reacting to the China-Pakistan American, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPAC. And their reaction to that, that alarms the Chinese. <clears throat> because why they are reacting? Gawada, and then from there, entering to the West Asia. So the Americans are very sensitive about the uh, footprints of the China, even in the, political econom uh, even in the political economic domain, not touching the security, but they are very much sensitive about the China. And if they are sensitive, then definitely there is a problem there. Then there is a conflict of interest? Yeah, Simple there is a that. conflict of interest. Uh, secondly, if you see that the Americans did not oppose or they did not impose the sanctions against India when they went for S-400 purchase of surface to air defense Besides system, defense system yes. but uh, the Americans reaction when the uh, Turkish went for that S-400 was very clear and the sanctions were Being a member there. of NATO also, interestingly. Yeah, that, despite this. Mm -hmm. So I think that the Americans' reactions are visible. They are not comfortable with this kind of the transformation in the foreign strategic policy of the Middle Eastern states, in which they are, their policies are giving more space to the, uh, you can say, multilateral approach, mm -hmm. or the Russia, in a way of the Russians and accommodating the Chinese. Correct. But at the same time, China, America's own influence seems limited there. Mm -hmm. And their influence all over the world is no more. It's no more. It's getting er eroded yeah, in so one way or the other. Their, their influence and what you call it, their sole superpower, hegemonic kind of a thing, have been challenged in the last one decade. And now today, it's a preeminent power. And it's going to be further, further challenged. Further challenged. Oh, that, no, I, that's I can a, give hmm. you an example. Uh, this W3, uh, what we call it, B, uh, B, B3, uh, built back prosper world, something like that, which Obama announced in the uh, June. Uh, in order to balance the C, uh, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, and this uh, Build Back uh, Better World, B3, we are not seeing any kind of a outcome of it, a materialization of that. It was so just on the, the papers, sir. Yeah, reality is a lot different. These yes. are the realities. And though the Americans started initiating, I was going to see, the, uh, I've seen, they pumped six billion in the Ukrainian war, Americans and their allies, and the Russians, uh, you can say, surplus have multiplied. 
so they are making though this they are uh, nato is expanding europe is now again in the lap of the american security domain but at the same time they are not able to uh, you can say uh, realign the entire world against the russia's this uh, because the, the dependence of the europeans on russia whether you talk about energy fuel petrol diesel gas coal even otherwise when you talk about trade that's a lot now coming to you sir since i'm running out of time but i want quick comments uh, from you uh, mr harley one thing sir now talking about the european union a very close ally of the americans uh, whether you talk about the the formation of nato <coughs> or otherwise to put a check on the russians being in the backyard and you know keep pushing them now what i'm what i'm seeing is that sir the european nations perhaps were pretty exhausted and they were not very happy with the americans uh, decision because at the end of the day it's the american narrative to put a check on the russians or perhaps the british narrative but a lot of other countries starting from romania germany norway finland sweden italy turkey even spain the dependence on the russian infrastructure of all supply i mean that is so much there that they were not ready uh, to to you know look after the certain particular i would call it a project of the americans to sort of uh, put pressure on the russians uh, not at the cost of their own economy so don't you think sir uh, as as a neutral uh, person uh, things are very different within uh, the european union as well i mean how long can they tow the policy of the americans uh, against the will and wish of the european people well, i live in germany and i've been watching the german government try to explain how it's going to move ahead with emergency rationing of gasoline and oil starting with cutting industry which could cost as many as 1 million to 1 and a half million jobs in the auto sector and related sectors how long can germany go along with that we have inflation running at 10 and a half percent which biden and everyone else is blaming on putin I think the issue whether you live in Europe or in the Middle East is the question of multilateral relations versus a unipolar order. The United States was able after uh destroying the Iraqi government and the Libyan government to insist that every country line up under its leadership. The Russians and the Chinese refused to give up their own economic sovereignty. And now we're seeing other countries see that and say well maybe there's a third way or an alternative that's why i think what actually is beginning to occur and this is what mrs larouche has been saying is a revival of the non-aligned movement the idea that countries should not have to choose between blocks especially if that means giving up the potential for economic development just a quick note on that relevant to pakistan the chinese I agree with the one speaker who said China is not trying to replace the United States in the Middle East. They're trying to create a different order, one based on economic cooperation and development, what Xi Jinping calls win-win. The China-Pakistan economic corridor is an example of that. This would have benefits for Pakistan as well as for Afghanistan as well as for China with extensions into Iran, Iraq and elsewhere. That's the Chinese approach. the american approach is you do what we say or else but the russians are showing that that's not enough and i think the splits that are starting to appear in europe there are people now saying for example when draghi and uh, schultz and macron went to kiev and met with zelensky publicly it seemed as though everything was fine privately the reports are they were pressuring him to negotiate and he was saying but the nato doesn't want us to negotiate there are splits beginning to occur because the effects of sanctions are hitting very hard in Europe in the United Kingdom and in the United States and especially in the poorer countries of the world so i think this tension between a unipolar order and a multilateral order will only increase to the extent the war continues in ukraine and the us continues to dictate economic policy worldwide all right now last question to you uh <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Al-Hashmi, uh, now let's talk about the European Union and the Middle East. Obviously, European Union has its own concerns. Whether you talk about JCPOA, again, European Union, the trade partners, and they really want Iran to be in the main uh, frame, and you know they want to do trade with Iran. There's there's so much out there to to be offered and to get in return. 
Number two, Saudi Arabia, UAE. I mean, look at the way the Europeans travel to UAE for that matter, not only to, uh, for, for the tourism business or perhaps uh, for their own investments and otherwise. Same the cases with Qatar, Turkey and so many other. I mean, look at the uh, Turkish uh, labor that's working in European Union, even in Russia, cheap labor, technically correct labor. But again, uh, that is of uh, some prime concern. Now, the question is over here, sir, do you think the Western nations, uh, in particular, I'm talking about the European Union, uh, need to strengthen the impression that they are fully committed to relations with the Middle East and not just pursuing this uh, American policy, perhaps? Your take, sir. Mr. Hashmi? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, he I heard your question. I heard your question. Please. Uh, um, I think the Europeans and the Americans now, you know, there is a subject you have probably haven't touched upon it much, which is the uh, uh, nuclear talks between Iran and the West. So that's a very important uh, factor because Saudi Arabia, UAE also wants the Americans to change their attitude. They want like a, uh, an approach more similar to the one Trump took during his presidency. This is another factor that is uh, uh, a very important factor when talking about the U.S.-Arab relations. As far as Europe is concerned, Europe and America uh, in general, they have the same approach into the Middle East with the exception of France that is trying to improve its presence, for example, in Libya or in uh, North Africa. So the main thing will come to a very important point in my mind, which is this. If governments, if Muslim governments, whether in Arab countries or in Pakistan or in Bangladesh or Southeast Asia, if they are representative of their people and working for the good of their people and negotiating on the basis of uh, getting the best results for their own people, then they still can manage to get to, to, to benefit from this, from China and from the United States and from Europe. But if you are the ruler of an Islamic country, whether Arab or non-Arab, and your main concern is, for example, how to beat your brothers and relatives to power or how to beat uh, this uh, political trend, you need the American support to keep them in jail or to keep them oppressed, then you are not negotiating for your, the benefit of your nation. You are only negotiating for the benefit of your person or your family. So this is the main thing for Muslim countries in general, including uh, Muslim countries in Asia or in the Arab world. We have to sort out our own order, our own house in order, so that we can benefit from this competition that is going on between America and, and China worldwide and Russia and stuff like this. So this is a, a very important point when talking about the Arabs, the Muslims, and China and America and Europe. All right, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, participation, Mr. Hashmi, uh, Mr. Hale, and uh, Professor. It was a pleasure having you in the program, sir. But unfortunately, we totally we have run out of time. But inshallah, we will we'll continue uh, to discuss this very important uh, uh, topic in the coming uh, days as well. And that's all we have uh, for this hour. Inshallah, I'll see you tomorrow at 8 or 5 p.m. Till then, you take good care of yourself. Good afternoon.